and welcome everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's parliamentary roundtable as part of the IGF 2020. And um, continuing the theme of, uh, of virtual meetings, we're going to discuss today, not just in a virtual setting, but how the internet affects parliament parliamentarians and our view of political trust. We've got a uh, a wide ranging discussion and some fascinating panelists from uh, parliaments all around the world. And what we're hoping to do in this very short 90 minutes is tease out some of the conversation about the internet and trust. But of course, what we can't do in the current setting is discuss anything around the internet and politics and parliament without bringing up the subject of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're going to focus a little bit in our discussion as well as how the how parliaments have responded to the pandemic and we've seen um, really in our work in the interparliamentary union that parliaments went from a, a a standing start how do you turn yourself into a virtual parliament how do you as a traditionally um, physical institution operate remotely and increasingly have to rely on digital technology and remote connections when uh, not only your members but your support staff aren't able to be physically present. So we've spent nine months in a way seeing parliaments become very very different in a number of countries and we've, we've gone through a period of some radical enforced innovation to emerge now perhaps nine months in without answers but with certainly some new solutions. And what we're hoping to do today is drill down into the conversation a bit about where parliaments have a role in terms of internet governance. And, and this is a two-sided conversation. Parliaments ultimately are the institutions that make law. And we have a lot of ongoing discussions and there's a lot within the IGF about the legal frameworks they operate that we operate in and the internet needs to operate in and national legislation no longer is 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 significant in some cases because it gets um, overtaken by other jurisdictions where sites are hosted where data is stored and the complexities that the internet has brought to us and brought to uh, legislators is uh, is well documented the other side of this is that as legislators uh, our MPs are now required to understand some complex technical issues, as well as issues of trust and, um, and privacy. We're also required to operate globally, and we've seen a number of parliaments work together to try and um, understand how the internet has impacted on a, a number of our social and political structures. So I hope that in the conversation today, which um, is, is a follow-up from last year where we introduced the Parliamentary Roundtable at the IGF, we can start to tease out a little bit about how the internet affects the life of politicians, how it affects the public's view of trust in our politicians, but also what it is that members of parliament and our legislators can do to sensibly manage the flow of information to understand issues of digital literacy and information literacy and how they can be advocates for a positive future in the internet. Uh, today's discussion is co-hosted by uh, the Interparliamentary Union and the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And so what I'd like to do now is call on the Under Secretary General of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, um, Mr. Li Zhenmin, to give us a short welcome. Mr. Li, over to you, please. Thank you, Andy, for moderating this roundtable session. Your honorable members of parliament from around the world, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome you all to this parliamentary roundtable 
a special highlight of this year's Internet Governance Forum. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this year's ITF is convened entirely virtually and is hosted by the United Nations. I extend my gratitude to the Interior Parliamentary Union for co-hosting this roundtable with the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. I also thank the government of Germany for organizing the first ever parliamentary session in Berlin last year. The session sent a strong message for national parliaments to cooperate and exchange best practices in, in internet related public policy issues. This year, we are grappling with the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and has laid bare our increasing reliance on the internet in so many ways. It is critical that the United Nations and the global community work together to ensure meaningful access for all people to the internet. This can be achieved with effective public policies and enhanced internet governance. Indeed, this resonates with the theme of this roundtable, building trust in a time of COVID-19 response and the post-COVID-19 recovery. Clearly, the national parliaments and the parliamentary institutions play a critical role. Not only do they contribute to regulatory frameworks for the effective use of the internet as a global public good, they also act as leaders and advocates for achieving sustainable development goals. In addition to legislative, budgetary, and oversight functions in their jurisdictions, national parliaments also have responsible representative roles. They define how people and organizations interact in an inclusive and trusted manner, especially in this fast expanding digital space. In the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation, he called for more actionable outcomes through high level sessions at the Internet Governance Forum with a specific reference to this parliamentary track. I urge you to respond to this key call and I wish you an uh, engaging, fruitful session. I thank you. Andy. Thank you, Mr. Liu. Sorry, I'm I was having a connection problem there. I'm, I'm sitting in the remote wilds of the, uh, the Scottish islands, and sometimes the internet just decides to stop itself. Uh, Mr. Liu, thank you very much for that. And I'd like to call on Mr. Martin Changong, who is the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, to also welcome us here today. Martin. Uh, thank you for moderating this session. Uh, Mr. Under Secretary General, uh, dear valued partner of the Interparliamentary Union, distinguished members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to address this opening uh, segment of uh, the uh, parliamentary uh, session organized on the occasion of the Internet Gov Governance Forum. Uh, I am delighted that we are organizing this event with our valued partners of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And I would like to use the opportunity also to thank the government of uh, Poland and its parliament for their support. We have not been able to meet physically this year, but uh, I hope that uh, next year we'll have ample opportunity, uh, the health pandemic willing for us to meet uh, in person. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Under Secretary General, you have just referred to uh, uh, last year's Internet Governance Forum during which parliamentarians called for more cooperation between parliaments and um, for them to come together in order to exchange best practices for dealing with internet related public policy issues. I'm delighted to say that the IPU is proud to sponsor 
uh, this uh, second parliamentary roundtable to allow uh, parliamentarians and other stakeholders to do just that, sharing good practice. I am also delighted that the voice of parliamentarians is now beginning to have a platform during the Internet Governance uh, Forum. This form of uh, transparent, inclusive, and multi-stakeholder discussion on the internet and digital uh, policy is critical for advancing trust in digital technologies and for fostering trust in the work of parliaments. The, the IPU is, of course, strongly focused on strengthening parliaments and through our Center for Innovation in Parliament, we and our participating parliaments are proud to be able to provide good practice, promote this good practice and digital innovation. This role has shone through amidst the pandemic where our networks have been used to support parliaments and share experiences globally on virtual and hybrid parliaments, enabling our democracies to function in these difficult and challenging uh, times. Parliaments must play a robust role in our democratic systems, but they are not untouched by the world around them. The internet has been a transformative tool for knowledge, information, and communication. And it has also been a dangerous and destructive tool fueling disinformation and conspiracy. It is up to parliaments and parliamentarians and uh, legislators to take these issues on board and ensure that legislation supports equitable access and digital literacy, but also that it protects citizens or societies from harm and attempts to subvert democracy. As a force for good, the internet is potentially unparalleled, but only if we can control the dangerous flow of this information. We must, as citizens, be able to trust what we see online just as we must be able to trust the legislators acting on our behalf. The internet has done damage to this bond of trust and it is imperative that parliamentarians and legislators work proactively to rebuild and strengthen trust in democracy, as well as to ensure that citizens can feel safe online and trust the information they find. We must understand how information is spread, how social networks operate, and how to counter the negative impact that ranges from disinformation to cyber attacks on our public bodies. I commend the members of parliament attending this meeting today, and I see there are many of them. Uh, we have, uh, if I look at uh, the screen here, some 160, uh, participants participating in this meeting. And uh, as I said, I commend them for being at the forefront of the debate, at the forefront of the conversation on building trust in this new digital age. And I hope that they will respond to the call for actionable outcomes. I wish you very fruitful deliberations. And I can assure you that the IPU will be prepared to support any recommendations that come out of your deliberations as we move forward with concrete action. Thank you very much. Martin Chang, thank you very much for those welcoming remarks. And to Lu Min, thank you also for your welcome. Um, to set the scene for this evening's discussion, I'd like to introduce Mr. Manuel Hoffelin, who is a member of the German Bundestag, and he will introduce to us a video that the Bundestag has prepared to um, outline the events of the first parliamentary roundtable last year. Uh, Mr. Hoffelin, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and I'm excited to announce that video with some uh, reviews of uh, the IGF last year in Berlin and Germany. And uh, as you know, as uh, mentioned, uh, it was uh, the uh, first year that we uh, had uh, this uh, 
meeting from the national parliamentarians and it was a very emotional day because uh, we just uh, uh, called out the Jimmy Schultz call as uh, some uh, of you just remember and so just let us see the video and enjoy it. Today, IGF has made a great step forward by including parliamentarians on this forum. And it is that we have connected the disconnected. In this case, parliaments, which at the end of the day, we are the ones making national legislations and the rules. So I think this is a very good approach and it was missing. So I take this back to my parliament and encourage other colleagues to get involved as well. I actually believe that parliamentarians are much closer to the multi-stakeholder approach and especially to civil society than executive actors often are. And we as parliamentarians, we are the legislators. We are the ones who decide it has to be done. It is not the executive branch that does that, and that is why we should also maintain a good, lively exchange among ourselves. And I believe we can also take a closer look at where we can, perhaps form networks worldwide, to be able to fight the authoritarian tendencies that are present in the world more effectively and to support each other. Personally, um, I think it's essential that politicians actually engage at every level, um, especially when you talk about um, uh, the internet governance. Because if you look at worldwide, parliamentarians are at the center of governance, anywhere you go in this world. I would strongly advise the IGF to do this through the path of parliamentary enthusiasm for these debates, for the exchange, and not to choose another formalized, possibly even channeled procedure. What was absolutely fascinating was how parliamentarians from all over the world participated in the discussions with such enthusiasm. Now, personally, I think the collaborative effort that actually I've seen in this IGF, I think, is a key thing that I can take away to, to my country and uh, at the level of Africa as, as a whole. Because if you look at the um, uh, um, in governance structure, um, it, in, it involves everybody, actually. You, you, you need to engage the executive, you need to engage civil society organizations, you need to in, engage international organizations, and you also need to engage every aspect of society. And I think the IGF 2019 actually has clearly shown that um, collaboration is key, and if you want this world to move forward, I think we need, all need to collaborate in, and uh, get away from our individual um, uh, convenience and come together as one nation, come together as one world, uh, so that we can move this um, uh, world forward. I think the key here is the collaborative effort that we actually have seen um, is a key takeaway. I think it is important because multi-stakeholderism can best be represented by parliaments. If you look at it from a state perspective, and in the past, solely governments have been involved too often. Here in Germany, in Europe, we often say, well, OK, they also take with them the opinion of many from the country. But in many parts of the world, it is a huge difference whether a government participates in the IGF or a parliament. I also find this appropriate for Germany, not because I am a politician from the opposition, but because of my deep conviction. I believe that the multi-stakeholder approach of the IGF for sure also means to involve parliaments, as they represent their people as well as different approaches and opinions in parliaments, the most and the best, and probably are also best in taking ideas from the IGF back into parliament's politics. The first thing is the ecosystem that is there. Actually, the IGF had tackled a lot of issues and each issue is related to another because we're looking forward for a better future, so we need to tackle uh, things as an ecosystem and not independently. This is the first thing. This is 
But I think the special thing about the IGF is that once a year you can meet with regard to a wide range of different topics, and that you can also develop topics that you hadn't even thought of before. So this leads me to, to think that knowing and meeting each, other's, each other in one room, talking about the same issues, is the best practical way of uh, diminishing the bridge between politicians and technical people. I believe that this is at the core of the Jimmy Schultz call, pushing the idea of exchange forward much more strongly. So I think that um, filter bubbles are a real problem. You need to look beyond your own horizon. You need to talk to other stakeholders. It is much better when parliamentarians from all over the world meet at an IGF and get so enthusiastic about the idea behind it that they stay in contact during the meeting and maybe even later throughout the year. I think that um, a practical measure to enhance cooperation is to create in this uh, IGF 2019 um, a steering committee from parliamentarians, which under the leadership of the German uh, parliament, we can all help you to uh, bring to our regions the spirit of IGF 219. I think parliament should designate focal points for, for this IGF process, and the Interparliamentarian Union should also create a specific committee on technical aspects and national laws so that these focal points can follow on the spirit of this, uh, of this forum. With regard to a liaison officer, I doubt that he really would bring more benefit than he would take away advantages namely from the parliamentarians, who may not come because they say we have representation already. This, I think, would be very bad. Today's inspiration is tomorrow's motivation. We are so motivated to work and to make it happen. And I want to be very clear, the IGF is especially inspiring when you're a part of it. Thank you very much to um, Manuel for introducing that video and to the Bundestag and German government for preparing that overview of the first parliamentary roundtable last year. And it set us up very nicely for a discussion we want to have this evening and to perhaps take forward some of the ideas about the roles that politicians can play in determining how we have an effective and accessible internet for all. So I'm going to call on our panelists to join us now in the conversation to make sure you've all got your video on. Um, Mr. Manuel Hofflin from Germany will stay with us. Um, Marguerite Escobar from El Salvador, Alexander Kinstein from the Russian Federation. And I'm hoping that uh, Ms. Biodun Olujimi from Nigeria has managed to connect and join us. Um, and uh, we haven't had time to check her connection yet, so hopefully that works. Uh, Mattia Fantinati from Italy, Italy and uh, Christoph Kakowski from Poland. So those are our six panelists for this evening and I welcome you all to this parliamentary roundtable. And I'm going to start with uh, Margarita Escobar, if I may, Margarita. Um, you talked a lot in there about the role of parliament and parliamentarians as the lawmakers and how important that was. And you, you mentioned in the video that it's important for uh, parliaments to be able to connect and engage. Um, I, I'd like you to reflect very, very briefly. I'm going to ask all the participants to reflect very briefly, a maximum of two minutes, if you don't mind, because of time, um, on how you think the internet 
has changed the relationship with parliaments, particularly in the sense of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've had to move to virtual and hybrid parliaments. Uh, we haven't been able to be physically present in the same way. Um, perhaps you could give some short reflections on how you think the restrictions around the pandemic have changed the, the relationship between parliament, parliamentarians and citizens, and, uh, and whether this is an opportunity to create something more open and transparent. Um, Margarita Escobar, over to you. I'm not seeing Margarita in here. Um, Manuel Hoffelin, I'm still seeing your video live and active. So can I can I go with you to ask you that as the first there question? There we go. Please? There we go. Oh, sorry, okay. Margarita, please. Thank yes, thank, I was saying thank you so much, uh, Andy, for this introduction. Emmanuel, thank you for the wonderful video. Um, as I look back and, <clears throat> and think about this year, uh, I'm very happy to tell you that I brought the the spirit, uh, Jimmy Shuttle, Shuttle uh, <clears throat> asked us to, to do in the Jimmy Schultz call. Uh, little we knew in Berlin that COVID was around the corner as we left Berlin. And then everything was pushed very, very fast to move into the internet digital era. I think uh, the COVID-19 asking, trying to answer your 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 question gave us an opportunity to get closer between parliamentarians and our stakeholders. Now, for example, I just finished a meeting with civil society because we're studying the, a law, a digital law that is uh, on personal data protection in Avias Data. But also it forced us to introduce a new bill regarding universal internet access as a, as a human right. And this is another issue that we're, we are studying very strongly here in El Salvador. Otherwise, <clears throat> a lot of people could be left behind and a lot of poverty could be uh, centered in those areas without internet access. COVID-19 presented us the opportunity to, to, to get trust back to politicians. Having politicians and technical people working together through virtual platforms, through internet, I happy. I am very happy that I said that a year ago at the uh, at the IGF in Berlin. Now I can tell you because of the practice that that we've been doing here in El Salvador that that is the right thing to do. COVID also has isolated uh, humanity and have isolated that human touch that will remain a challenge for the future. Internet can help us be more transparent, rebuild trust, uh, um, study bills in a, in, a, in a more consultative manner, but we have the problem of the personal contact and that is yet to be seen. As to the misinformation systems that are also are in place in internet, we have a big challenge there. We don't know how to approach this issue. What, are we, what we're doing is I took from Berlin the Declaration on Human Rights and Internet. And what we're doing here is taking that Declaration on Human Rights and Internet and trying to change it into a bill. We don't know how it's going to end up, how we're gonna work it out, but, it's, it's, but it has been introduced in our legislation and we are going to be studying that aspects of internet. So I think it's my two minutes. Uh, a multi-stakeholder approach is one, to increase trust. Politicians and technical people building laws is another way to increase trust. And third, we need to continue working on the misinformation um, aspects of internet. Thank you very, very much, Margarita Escobar. Um, Krzysztof Kukowski, can I go to you now and ask you the, the same question? How, and particularly focusing on how you think digital technologies can help us facilitate more transparent and inclusive communication. 
Thank you, Andy. Thank you for this uh, presentation and uh, discussion. Very interesting. In Poland, uh, we strongly support universal access to the internet. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown how important it is in our lives and uh, everyday matters to provide with access to the internet and how strategic it is only for the users themselves, but also uh, for the world economy. It's mine. There is still much to be done here, starting with investments in broadband infrastructure through digital education and uh, activization of society mm, to such issues as cybersecurity and data protection and the user himself. Mm, the current technological development, uh, including the spread of the internet, but also recently the pandemic has resulted in the transfer of many forms of social life into digital space. Uh, this is a first and fundament uh, realizing. Uh, this makes uh, it necessary to develop uh, digital components and skill uh, even faster. Uh, the current digital transformation will lead in the near future to the disappearance of some profession as well as to transformation of others and the creation of the new ones. Then uh, the ability to use digital tools will simply be necessary in the labor market. There was, is, and will be a great role of the government, parliament, uh, this uh, round table to diminish digital exclusion as much as possible. This is my opinion, and thank you, and if for um, uh, my uh, voice, thank you. Uh, Christoph Kokowski, thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Manuel Hofflin, um, you were present at the IGF last year, like mm. Margarita, and you certainly had some interesting comments there. I, I particularly liked a comment that you made, uh, which was perhaps more of a technical one, but I think is very, very interesting. As you said, that the discussion about representing parliaments and parliamentarians that perhaps it was a bad idea to have a technical representative um, what really mattered was members of parliament talking to themselves um, and amongst themselves and sharing that information and and i'd like if you wouldn't mind if you would just elaborate on that a little bit and talk about how it's not just important that um, parliamentarians talk to citizens in their own country, but also about that global dialogue that parliamentarians can hold and why that matters. Yes, Andy, thank you very much. It's a very uh, good point. I think um, last year we just, we just found out that there are many parliamentarians all around the world who uh, just are wondering how is internet governance working around in their national areas in their nations so we, we a lot of we, we we as parliamentarians often look at the own country and do our uh, uh our things in 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 our nation or in uh, a wider area like the european union but normally as parliamentarians you not often talk to other parliamentarians around the world and it's an other kind of uh, exchange of thinking of possibilities, what you can learn from, from other countries and parliamentarians, they have the, the same uh, problems and the same ideas in other countries all over the world. So it's very interesting to come together. So like Margarita say, uh, it's in one room. Now we are in a virtual room, but it's better than nothing. So. Uh, I'm excited to see you maybe next year. I hope so next year, really in one room. And uh, just just uh, just let me let me that note. Uh, I'd like to encourage the idea of an informal parliamentarian work group, uh, just that they can develop and gather ideas from the IGF plus and get in touch with our fellow Polish friends to implement maybe first ideas. Uh, on the next year's IGF parliamentary track. Uh, so that's also maybe the, 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 poss the possibility to stay in touch around the year and not only at the um, IGF uh, once a year. So if uh, you are interested in such a work group, dear colleagues, I'd 
like to offer uh, some kind of coordination with your help. As Margarita said last year, uh, I think it would be a great chance to, to stay in contact and to exchange a lot of views. And uh, it would, would, I would be glad if we parliamentarians could enforce our last year's good work from all over the world, also in the future IGF, uh, for example, with Margarita's help. And I think uh, most of you are interested in staying together. And uh, I think last word for me, that's, that's the idea of what Jimmy Schultz uh, thought about as uh, we uh, formed out the Jimmy Schultz call. He, he always wondered why on all the IGFs are so many uh, representatives from the governments and so few parliamentarians. And so let us change this. I think it would be a great approach. Thank you, Manuel Hoffling. I think that's um, that's a very generous offer to uh, to, to lead on that. And um, I I can certainly echo in the last nine months that the, the value of networking is um, is there for us all to see in the interparliamentary union. Certainly, in the centre for innovation in Parliament, where I'm based, we've seen that the networks that we've built around other matters have just come to the fore in helping the, solve the problems of the pandemic and bringing parliaments together. So I think that's at a technical level at a um, at an elected member level there is certainly an opportunity there so I think that's a that's a very very good offer um, Mr Mattia Fantanati from Italy I'd like to bring you on next and I'd like you to to think a little bit in terms of what we can do around um, connecting parliament with citizens and how the internet helps that in the context of more marginalized groups and particularly those that have more challenging access to information and to the internet. Uh, Mr. Fantinati, can I ask you to join us, please? Good evening, good, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, distinguished colleague, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, I would like to respond to your question that is very, very interesting because uh, this is uh, a topic that's not about the COVID-19, but it's something more. Uh, I want to say just in two minutes about my, uh, I would like to talk about my political party because we have uh, some very original uh, uh, set up that's my political party's name, the Five Star Movement, was born online and has always operated in the world wide web, involved the citizen, in government, by means of the internet, and developing trust in the use of an information technology as a way to strengthen democracy and fighting corruption. But it's not just my own party, but I think this is a global issue because if I have to uh, uh, just to have a make a spot on the uh, of what's happening in the Europe, I can say that the times now look grim for liberal democracy because we are a system, are, are the face of the uh, dec decline of electoral turnout, and we are a shrinking membership of the people for the major po political parties. And at the same time, we are facing an age of people disillusioned about the policy. And the last but not the least, of course, COVID pandemic. The vast majority feels abandoned and underrepresented. Uh, I think that there is a problem for our liberal democracy of participation and very often from uh, a lack of legitimacy. So in, in this part, they, the citizens feel themselves to be uh, out of the institution, something very far, but there's a huge divide. Just because we believe, and I believe, that the internet can give the people the instruments to develop a sort of critical thinking. And in a sort of way, we, the internet can gather us together in one platform, in one environment. Every citizen, every citizen may be ignorant about something on his own, but if we turn them in a single node of a potential never ending web, we build a collective intelligence. And so we can have our parliament to have, to make a good job. So it means to put our citizen on the on the center of the stage. Let just me conclude in a very 10 seconds uh, that it's very important that our parliament are in the IGF, but it would be as important as well that our country, our parliaments are included in our multi-stakeholder advisory group like the MAG that, that in a sort of way organized the IGF. And I would like to end up 
just having my email address right in there on the comments just to be in contact with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mattia Fantinati. Um, Alexander Kinstein, um, I'm going to, to try and take um, Mattia's point forward a little bit, and I'm going to ask you about, uh, we're talking about how we can better connect parliament, parliamentarians and citizens together. Um, Mattia, there we're drawing on uh, the, the challenge that some people have connecting. It's not a level playing field. Um, could you reflect perhaps just for a couple of minutes on how you as a politician think about um, how you connect to people and make sure in, in your own work that you don't create a new elite of digitally literate citizens and leave others behind and how, how that challenge plays out for you as, in your role as a member of parliament. Um, Mr. Kinstein, over to you. Yeah. Спасибо. Добрый вечер, уважаемые дамы и господа. Я благодарю организаторов форума за возможность выступить и возможность обменяться опытом парламентариями. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to the organizers of this forum. I am ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely convinced that the problems that, that we are able to see here, that we are witnessing, are the are problems not temporary that are problems. really uh, something that we can uh, take up. Uh, we are having to do with a huge country and we have different zones, uh, time zones and different uh, climate conditions. And it is obvious uh, have that a multitude uh, of topics uh, it is to solve, really difficult a multitude to, of problems uh, before us. To live under the conditions uh, of the pandemic. Uh, so uh, we obstacles. have to realize uh, that the parliament together with the civil society the already on the, the first days uh, of uh, uh, the pandemic started to develop a very specific measures how to solve to the problem with the as well as very specific paths of, of current uh, situation solution and recovery i can tell you that in russia today we can see unprecedented uh, voluntary movement a movement of volunteers it is not just dozens so we are having to do with hundreds of thousands of people all over the country uh, who are involved in that movement of the volunteers and they help uh, uh, medical professionals uh, they uh, distribute uh, medical uh, uh, products uh, medicines uh, to elderly people uh, and also uh, Transportation is also provided by them uh, from the houses uh, of people uh, who are patients and who are sick, to, and they are moved uh, in private vehicles uh, by volunteers to hospitals uh, as well as, uh, well, I am representative of the lower house of the parliament. All the members of uh, parliament also decided to allocate uh, their monthly now salary uh, to fight against the, the COVID and the, uh, the party, in the, uh, the one Russian party. This is the party I represent also, collect over one billion rubles who and decided to uh, allocate to the fight against COVID. Uh, by joint efforts, uh, we uh, also worked out uh, different digital mechanisms uh, which uh, uh, help people to overcome the consequences of the pandemic. One of the mechanisms uh, that can be interesting also for other countries uh, is the one that uh, it is uh, connected uh, with the support of people uh, of who are using the services of education, especially uh, children in school, and it's about remote and education. I'm for them. talking this about is, uh, uh, digital special education regime. online. That is why together with uh, the largest uh, publishing houses, holdings, as well as the ministries responsible for a uh, different uh, uh, has uh, worked out the possibility of providing online education uh, when there was a special channel also, uh, uh, sorry, a portal was established, the uh, online portal, uh, and uh, you can also um, go there and see it. Well, it's in Russian, but you can watch it. Uh, it's something for you to also learn a foreign language. So using that specific internet portal, uh, you are uh, able uh, to uh, uh, identify different subjects uh, and they are connected with, uh, uh, you know, uh, the curriculum. Uh, we have also been able uh, to launch television education, remote education on television when on federal TV station, uh, when we are having, uh, we have 99% of the area of our country. And in the morning, uh, uh, in the period of three hours, uh, simultaneously together with uh, online uh, transmission, there are also classes conducted uh, and they are transmitted in the television broadcast for children at school. 
so uh, this is a uh, experience that we uh, we have developed and we believe that it can also be quite useful for other countries uh, and i also realize uh, that this um, online education uh, it is something that should always be developed uh, by individual countries. Russia was going along this path to develop it finally. Uh, I do not know how interpreters are going to interpret uh, the Russian saying into English, but it says, uh, well, there uh, is a silver lining, okay? It is the silver lining. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks to coronavirus, as I said before, uh, we today in Russia, we have developed uh, this voluntary um, uh, development uh, that uh, uh, is really very good. Thanks to coronavirus, uh, we today were able to uh, actually introduce all uh, our subjects uh, for uh, for um, a secondary school and this is the work that is moving on thanks to coronavirus uh, and thanks to uh, this we have developed uh, we have also developed different internet-based products and first of all it is about remote learning it's about online education and this has developed very well and uh, well it is not on the basis of zoom uh, but also on uh, the basis of other platforms today in russia it is very practical that we have communication different undertakings meetings uh, webinars and they are being organized on a regular basis uh, and almost uh, all the meetings are being organized online now and we are also developing today uh, our uh, own uh, products because we believe that it's also very important this is something that is really very good uh, i uh, didn't really want to talk about the measures of support that were adopted by the government uh, uh, for our society as well as in, it is, uh, in order to support IT industry and internet. We simply do not have much time, uh, but if you're interested, you can communicate with me directly and I can co communicate that information directly to you. And dear colleagues, to conclude, uh, I would like also to move on to some negative aspects. Uh, uh, I can see that there are two um, uh, addresses that I'm going to speak, but I know that I really would like to uh, reduce uh, my time to give more time to the others. So I also would like to say a few words about negative trends that have unfortunately uh, developed uh, 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 in connection with digital technologies, in connection with COVID-19. It is a huge increase of IT crime. Uh, cyber crime and we see this problem in russia i can see that it is huge uh, cyber crime for the first six months of 2020 has gone up by uh, like 200 percent twofold today according to official statistics every uh, fourth crime in russia is committed uh, on the basis of it technology well, those uh, crimes uh, that are connected to, uh, with uh, communication, uh, uh, internet communication for fraud, uh, and there are different fraud products. Uh, uh, well, there are there is also some illegal transfers from bank accounts, um, hacking of bank accounts, etc. It is really huge now. That is why I would like to address you, uh, dear colleagues, uh, with uh, the call to activize our joint efforts to fight against cyber crime because it applies to everyone, because a, a significant part uh, of crimes uh, that are committed in Russia, unfortunately, it starts uh, outside of our borders, because those criminals, quite many of them, are uh, physically not present in Russia. Uh, that is why I believe that uh, uh, people really suffer from that. Uh, criminals from other uh, jurisdictions, they commit crimes also against your uh, citizens in your territory. Uh, and it's also possible that our criminals, Russian criminals, uh, also uh, destroy your citizens, just as Russian citizens uh, are harmed uh, by criminals uh, who commit their crimes from the territory of some other countries. It is not about politics, it's just about crim criminal activity. So a very important stage in the development of different international instruments in the area of information security as well as fight against cyber security as the adoption of the resolution of the general assembly of the united nations uh, on uh, the counteracting uh, of uh, information technologies to commit crime uh, i believe that the initiative the initiative of um, the, uh, of adoption of this document was my country which is the russian federation uh, so that the cooperation uh, 
uh, in uh, cyber space is uh, incredibly important. That is why we have to uh, work uh, uh, together in the uh, area of fight against cyber crime. And this document is quite well distributed all over the United Nations. So I would like to uh, recommend uh, to you uh, to consider the draft document, which can be refined, obviously, but it should become a catalyzer for the development of uh, uh, unified methods to fight against uh, uh, internet technologies as well as cyber crime. Unfortunately, I have to conclude my address now, and we can see that internet does not only unite pe unites people, uh, but it is also an instrument uh, that uh, can cause harm and suffering. It does not only bring people together, but it can also bring um, a negative impact. I believe that everyone understands how uh, it works. Unfortunately, internet and different problems connected with coronavirus, um, uh, they also provoke some negative tendencies. They trigger negative tendencies. And uh, we uh, all over the world, we simply have to uh, uh, act against that. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. And if you have any problems and any questions, I can answer them. Thank you, Mr. Kinstein. Um, I think the summary there is that we've had some interesting discussions how the internet is, is a good thing for many of us with a number of caveats and a number of negatives. Um, Marina Kallerand from the European Parliament, I'm going to give you the unenviable task of summarizing as quickly as you can, really, uh, what you've just heard in the last uh, 25 minutes of discussion. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Andy. I'll try to do my best. Uh, I, I listened and I'm very grateful to all the participants. And it was interesting that many same topics, many same priorities were mentioned by almost all our speakers. So I would underline that the COVID crisis, it's a tragedy for people, but we should take advantage of the tragedy which means that it, it has brought digitalization to the top of political agenda. We should keep it there. We should work with that. Yes, there are benefits like remote working, like remote schooling. There are also negative sides like cybercrime, cybersecurity. I would also mention cyber hygiene because each and every person today has to know much more about cyber hygiene than previously. And maybe to add to my Russian colleague, I completely agree. International cooperation is crucial, and I would underline the importance of one of the conventions we already have on cybercrime. It's the Budapest Convention, which is open to all countries to accede. A couple of other words. Cooperation has to be on all level, starting with the United Nations. And this year, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And I think that it's very timely that the United Nations has attached so much attention to digitalization. I had the privilege to serve on Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation. So cooperation, security, trust are the key words where we can cooperate a lot. From there to regional cooperation, and I very much like the idea of closer cooperation among parliamentarians. Because when we talk about multi-stakeholders, yes, we mentioned government, Yes, we mention academia, private sector, industry, IT. We do not mention politicians specifically, but I would argue that parliamentarians who have been elected by people should have a say. So I very much support uh, that idea. I'm having today a double hat. I'm a member of European Parliament, but I'm from Estonia, a country that has had for 30 years the privilege of online services. And trust me, guys, e-life has its benefits. So we have the benefits of open, transparent society, online voting, but everything is possible if people trust. Trust is the word that was re re repeated by so many colleagues, trust between government and private sector, trust between citizens and service providers, trust between citizens and governments. Because if there is no trust, our people will not be able to take advantage of the digital benefits. And earning trust, building trust, that is something where I would argue politicians, members of parliament are well positioned. And my very last remark, now representing the European Parliament, 
I'm really happy that uh, in our next budget, we have digital digitalization high on political agenda from all, all perspectives, being it uh, the, the data strategy, uh, being it a fight against uh, corruption, being it protection of human rights online. So all those aspects are equally important. So Andy, I tried my best. But uh, I, I'm sure that many right things will be said. And colleagues, it's a pleasure to see you all. Sorry, not live, not face to face this time online. But that's not the last time we're meeting and talking. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. That was um, a very passionate, and uh, I appreciate brief summary of um, of the power of the internet to, to change the way that we see democracy and our, rep our representation. Um, Florence Levy from uh, Nicaragua, I'm going to call on you now to just reflect very briefly on what you've heard in the last uh, session and um, particularly just picking up on your thoughts on trust. Para mí es buenas tardes, buenas noches, para los que ya es de noche, eh, un fraterno saludo. Welcome everyone, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Greetings from our beautiful country, from Nicaragua. Last year, we also had a chance to take part in the meeting that took place in Berlin, in Germany and we took an active part in it. I would like to say that what we heard today, as well as yesterday, during all the sessions of this IGF meeting, um, shows that as parliamentarians, we have to be more conscious, we have to be more aware of the social context and the economic context. Access to internet is essential. It has to be provided everywhere in all the countries of the world, yet we know that in some countries that access is not perfect, and I'm talking about developing countries here. I would also like to mention the health issues during the pandemic. This is where it is absolutely essential to have a strong model of healthcare system also available online because that will allow us to take care of our citizens and of the families. So it's a huge difference to know that uh, that healthcare system is uh, free of charge or perhaps you have to pay for it. Another issue is that you have to face the reality and that reality is different in different countries. It's important to know what sort of approach is going to allow us to develop appropriate coordination of activities within the healthcare system at the same time minding the economy. For a country like ours, for Nicaragua, 40% of our citizens live in rural areas. 80% of urban dwellers work uh, in the uh, shadow eco uh, economy. So we have to remember that and we cannot fully lock our economy down. We cannot afford a full lockdown and the parliament has to bear that in mind and has to develop its strategies accordingly. So it's important to find creative ways of uh, working further on and developing our economy. This is something that the parliament needs to bear in mind always. And in Nicaragua, we basically cannot afford not to work. However, we have to reinvent our work. We have to find a different way to perform our duties online, remotely, of course. Another important issue is how to maintain communication. I think the internet is providing huge support here. I think it was said yesterday during one of the sessions, it's about communicating not just among parliamentarians, but also in a cross-border manner. I'm talking about international uh, communication among all sides, all parties. Uh, in Latin America, we 
have uh, the parliament in Nicaragua, but we also have a parliamentarian assembly for uh, Latin America, and we have to take care of bilateral relations as well as intercontinental relations. So it is essential that the communication is ongoing. Another issue that I would like to mention is the use of technology. Of course, technology is becoming essential. It's becoming very, very important. And under the circumstances, communication is also key for consultations. Whenever we adopt an illegal solution, we, we have to consult it with others. However, we are not able to convene in a single room with all stakeholders. We have to do it online. We have to use the internet to achieve it. Another issue that I would like to mention is uh, the, the broadcasting of parliament meetings on TV, online, on social media. This is something that we are only just learning, yet we are already practicing it because we want to make sure that our citizens trust the parliament, that that trust is maintained. In our country, uh, our legal acts are already published uh, in a digital form. We also have to bear in mind multilingualism and interpretation, translation and interpretation. Many parliamentarians, many parliament members need an interpreter in order to be able to send their message to the citizens in, in, in multiple languages. I'm talking about multilingual countries here. And I think there's going to come a time when we will come back to physical meetings, to in-person meetings, but we will have to remember biosecurity. This is not only true of the parliaments, but it's true of the entire societies, the societies that will have to adapt to the new normal, to the new reality. We, we also have to utilize local media, radio stations, TV stations, local ones. We, we cannot only rely on the internet because uh, not everywhere the, the majority of the, of the citizens have access to internet and are fully connected. And here I mostly talk about remote areas, rural areas, where the digital infrastructure is still lacking. I would also like to mention that at present, for instance, owing to what my Russian colleague said, so the increase in cyber um, crime. This is something that we, we see in our country as well. We are introducing certain legal stipulations uh, to prevent that phenomenon. We had to consult on that, but we also had to pass these solutions, the, this legislation as soon as possible in order to protect our internet users. Internet um, uh, security is, uh, is a huge challenge. Another one that we are now facing, another challenge that we are now facing is uh, uh, digital literacy. Parliamentarians, well, perhaps we need to have younger parliamentarians, but every single parliamentarian needs to know how to use, for instance, teleconferencing software. You have to invest in that as well, invest in training, invest in digital infrastructure, because we have to know that that situation can come back, it can recur, or it can take a long time still. And we have to remember that when designing our budgets. All digital issues are going to be more and more present in our life. Cybercrime is a huge challenge, as I said before. And I am happy that we are talking about that as well here in this forum. We also need to exchange information among parliaments when it comes to legislation uh, regarding these issues. We can learn from one another. We can follow what we do. Uh, we can uh, look for good legislative examples wherever they might be. So we have to keep analyzing this topic because it's becoming key also on a global level. We will need digital technologies ever more, and we will depend on them to a greater extent. To finish with, I would like to say that we should get even more involved in the work 
to uh, implement international conventions focusing on cybercrime and other activities online. That's why inter interparliamentary collaboration is so important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was uh, Florence Levy from Nicaragua. Thank you. I think you summarized that very well. There's uh, certainly a clear challenge there that we uh, need to be thinking collaboratively and not working individually. Um, time is running away on us, so I'm going to just reshape this session a little bit dynamically. And what I'm going to do is ask our original contributors very quickly in one minute to summarize a a voluntary commitment that they or their institution wants to make to try and take the role of parliamentarians forward in terms of the internet governance space. And I'm going to start, if I may, with uh, Margarita Escobar. So Margarita, if I could ask you in just one minute to summarize the commitment that you would like to make around parliamentarians and uh, IGF. You're muted. Sorry, Margarita, you're you're still muted. Sorry. There we go. Are we? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think we need to understand that pres the presumption of good faith uh, will not be enough to build trust. We need to construct a blueprint and to work on it, uh, on democracy and human rights online, fight against corruption and the power of the moral authority. We need to work on security systems online that can be shared among all parliamentarians. Also, I think the future will challenge the UN to put us together to work on a new blueprint for development that can carry basic points of access to technology, access to internet, access to financial um, resources to develop digital infrastructure in those areas that, are, that have no access, as well as uh, building this uh this new approach of of development and <clears throat> access to new educational tools through technology those are really challenging times for for humanity i i appreciate very much the benefits of internet but i also recognize the challenging challenges for developing countries as el salvador is and finally, I would like to leave a reflection on all of you. And that is a question is, how do we perceive history? Do we perceive history as something of the past that belonged to others or history as now and we? And I think that poses an important question to all of us. If we perceive history as now, and no, as yesterday, and as we, and not others, I think we'll be building the humanity that we all wish to have with this wonderful tube of internet. So my commitment is to continue to work on these issues in my own territory, my own square meter in El Salvador as a legislation and legislator, and also to keep alive the Yimmy Schultz spirit that we're so grateful for and that was shown up in Berlin last week, last year. So thank you to all of you. And I look forward in continue working with all of you. Thank you, Margarita. That was, uh, that was fabulous. And I think that call to arms at the end is, uh, is very, very important. And that will, that will drive us forward. Uh, Manuel Hofflin, I'm um, going to ask you to, to suggests uh, perhaps something that, that you or the Bundestag might do. And I'm going to ask you for the elevator pitch on this one as, as briefly as possible, please. Two. So, yes, now now it's uh, the audio is on. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think, as Margarita said, international cooperation 
uh, is extremely important if we want to share uh, um, the the viewing on the same topic. You know, if you if you see the 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 big questions we have in digitalization all around the world, there are different views, and everybody can learn from each other, not only in one direction. And I think this is a very important uh, thing if you exchange. Uh, uh, the, 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 the point of view and uh, discuss it in in an in an equal uh, in an in a playing in, an, in, a, in the same field you know as as parliamentarians and I just you know I, I'm a chairman of the committee of the digital agenda in the German Bundestag and I would like to uh, push this uh, informal uh, cooperation or informal work group uh, between uh, the parliaments just to exchange our point of views in digital questions in general. So we will have special topics, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's mostly and it's important to, to network uh, more between the parliamentarians in several digitalization questions. And so we can learn from each other. We can uh, learn for our own countries just because we learn the point of view from the other side of the world. And so let us use the internet to stay uh, stronger together in and to make a virtual room. Uh, and I hope sometimes we will meet in, an, in a real room like Margarita uh, said, uh, but in the meanwhile, uh, let us uh, be in, in that great internet network together and exchange uh, our opinions and let's talk about it. That would be, what Jimmy Schulz would want it to, that we should enforce it. And that's what I would like to push. Thank you very much, Marvin Hofflin. And I think it would be um, it would be a pleasure for us all to be sitting in the same room and hopefully that will come about very soon. Uh, Mattia Fantanati, I'm going to go to you now. Now I've asked the others to make a, a very short uh, commitment. Can I ask you to do the same? And can I ask you to think about it in the in the context of how that might appear to, to the, the citizens as well, not just for MPs, but to citizens. And I'm sorry to put that on you in, in a, really in one minute, but uh, over to you. Uh, yes, I think it's a very important topic. Uh, I, mm, I don't know if I have a, a, a solution, but I am sure that uh, the, the digital cooperation is a multi-stakeholder effort, and we have to do it. We have to put the government in the center, and we, and, uh, we have to involve all the private sector, the technology, the companies, like is doing a, a high level panel of digital cooperation. Uh, I belong to this panel, but uh, I think that I am the only parliamentarian there. Uh, just let me conclude in 30 seconds, because there is a one important, important thing that I think that every parliamentarian could do, to, to suggest to send to their governments uh, the contract of the web. And it's a really important paper that emphasizes three aspects. One, uh, duties arise for everyone, because it is the future of the internet. It doesn't belong to a particular uh, segment of a life, but is is of everyone. So, a, a government in the country of the web has a right to duties. Companies has a right to duties, and citizens and the right to duties. So let's share this document. Let's share how was best practice, like I, I am doing, and stay in contact. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Now we're running. Short on time. So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Hassanul Haq from Bangladesh, who's kindly joined us as an observer in this, to perhaps just very, very briefly, Mr. Haq, uh, in two minutes, if you can, to reflect on those commitments that you've heard. Uh, hello, can, can you hear me? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, what I heard that the post COVID situation has exposed the ongoing. Uh, socio-economic political structure of the world and the countries. To that extent, I think that uh, what I have heard here, uh, uh, we need to see the post-COVID situation from the emerging situation, look at the post-COVID situation through equity lens, number one. Number two, let us focus on enhanced capabilities. How to apply digital technology without digital divide in the case of e-learning, e-governance, e-agricultural, e-health, 
so that everybody can participate. Access to equality, quality health for all level. Here ICT application is very important. How to develop that ICT capabilities. Effective access to the emerging technologies which is rocking the fourth industrial revolution. That is very important. How we cooperate in the technology transfer and knowledge transfer. And to implement all these things, the present government system need to be reformed and need to become more simple and agile. Let us cultivate health well-being, support health through targeted programs, physical, social, mental, and financial well-being. And let us develop a human-centric politics. For that, we need to enact new laws to reform the government. Already discussed here, I add, yes, we need to go for certain global agreement and certain laws at the national level where the parliamentarians need to act very quickly. Here, at the global level, uh, to, to check the cyber crime, a global cyber treaty, but we need also a global agreement on data. We need a global agreement on the emerging economics of internet. So these are the areas where we need to emphasize. At the same time, at the local level, we need to emphasize on certain very important laws. Here discussed access to internet should be an universal human right. It's a fundamental right which should be ensured by the government, but the post-COVID situation has exposed the weaknesses of the society. So we need to go for universal healthcare, universal education, universal food security system, universal social safety net. And all these sectors should be declared as basic fundamental human rights to be enacted in the constitution. And the government is bound to ensure these areas so that the digital divide and the social divide is wiped out. For all these things, the application of internet is very important. So how you apply internet to reduce the social and digital divide, that is the job of the parliamentarians across the world in the country also. So I uh, don't go further. I concentrate the letters in the fourth industrial revolution and the we are passing through third industrial revolution. So we are entering the domination of the machines. How to make the dominations of the machines more human? So that is a very important thing where the parliamentarians need to focus. So uh, we having said that, I let me end that, well, uh, we are living in a, a glass house, which is transparent, but in that glass house, uh, the state machinery, the children, the woman, the individual life of a citizen is there. So managing cyberspace is very important, very important. So I hope uh, we need a safe internet, trust toward the internet. And for that, we need to have an agreement on the standardization of technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you that, was, um, that was a really good uh, intervention at the end. And I think um, just promoting the, the inclusivity of the internet is very, very important. And uh, talking of inclusivity, inclusivity, I'm going to try now to um, ask Francesco Berti, who's had his hand raised for quite a while, to, um, to make an... Um, Francesco... Is Hello, can you hear me? Can you see me? I can hear you. I can't see you, but let's go ahead. Yes, perhaps now you can see me. Hello? Yes, we hear you and it, I can see you. Perfect. So, yeah, uh, uh, there was a, I'm Francesco Berti, parliamentarian from uh, MD from Italy. I'm also from the Five Star Movement as my colleague, Mattia Fantinati. I would like to thank you and the Internet Governance Forum for organizing this event. Uh, we have been asked about uh, digital education. And uh, I think, as was, it was written, we need more young parliamentarian to, to 
push this digital innovation. And in Italy, we created this, we did mainly three things. We're working on the digital education of public officials. Apologies, I guess we cannot hear Francesco. Um, I'm not sure if your mic is working. Perhaps you can put the question in the chat box uh, for the rest to know, but we, we cannot hear you at all. Uh, can you hear sorry, me now? Can, I, I, yeah, I, I can hear you, Francesco. Is Manuel? Okay. I can hear you and I can see you. Okay, perfect. So, uh, yeah, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, and I, uh, I was talking about how in Italy we're tackling the problem of digital education because in Italy we are the last one for uh, dig uh, digital uh, uh, education of public official. This is a very uh, serious matter. We are trying to. Uh, for to, to give digital competencies to the people who are like on the top, so to the uh, director general, and then we can believe that by uh, giving them the knowledge about digital public administration, we can then uh, give the knowledge to the people who are like on the middle management. Then we approved a parliamentary inquiry committee on fake news because we believe that fake news is really a threat for democracy, although sometimes is used also fake news as a instrument to do political battles. But uh, we think that fake news is a threat on political democracy. And then on the young people, they don't just need uh, digital education, I feel, but also civic education. So if you give uh, people, you uh, learn them empathy and respect, then empathy and respect can be applied also on the digital platform because the young people of course the new generation can do know how to use uh, the digital platform perhaps even better than the other people uh, on a general perspective i think that now also with the victory of uh, biden in the united states there can be a, 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 a new discovery a new path for the multilateral international organization and uh, I think that COVID-19 is, uh, is a war speed instrument that uh, made our public administration go closer, innovate, go uh, further in the digital innovation. But I feel that uh, in Italy is an example, but I, I also know, in, uh, I also think in many countries around the world that uh, digital innovation is not a problem about technology, it's a problem about organization. And uh, I feel that the most important problem that we need to tackle as international community is the problem, which is also a problem of governance, is the most poli political problem that there is, which is taxes. Because as someone said, uh, Mukaberi, in the comments, that uh, we have international platforms which are creating their own, their own rules and parliamentarian and govern uh, are like, in a way, not following the rhythm because uh, the, the uh, platform are already working at an international level at the government and par parliaments for definition are working on a national level. So we have to work to create equality, to create uh, a fair competition. And because the big business now are basically an oligopoly now. I know that there is the OXE working, which is work trying to create a international uh, framework for taxes. But we need to work on taxes also at national level if the multilateral uh, coordination at international level is not working because we need to tax digital platform to create and redistribute wealth. And also there is a big problem of privacy. I'm happy that in Europe with the GDPR, we are the top notch in the world to safeguard the privacy. And uh, that gives me to, to conclude my inter my speech and I would like to say that someone said trust. I, I'm also very confident on the role for digital platform to uh, connect government and people. But without regulation, I feel that the digital innovation cannot just create trust, but can also create manipulation. We have to be aware of that. I'm, of course, I'm here. I'm confident about the good thing that innovation and digitalization can bring to us. But I have to say that without regulation, without control on fake news, without control on uh, people privacy, without control on uh, the, the ownership of the platform, trust can also, uh, internet and uh, connection and communication via internet can also become manipulation. Thank you for the space and I will look forward to participate to more of this panel.
Uh, thank you, Francesco. That's a, that's a really powerful intervention, I think, for us to finish with. I'm aware there are some other attendees with their hands up, but we don't have sufficient time to go to them. Um, thank you, everybody, for the participation. What I'm going to do now is ask uh, Krzysztof Kachowski from the Polish Parliament, on behalf of Poland, who are one of the co-hosts of, of this event, to read out a summary of the output document for the parliamentary roundtable. And the output document is something that's been um, drafted in advance of this session and is available until the end of the IGF for anyone to comment on and make suggestions on. And if you go to the IGF website, you should be able to see that and access it. So Christoph, if you'd just like to um, summarize that document for us, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you for this uh, interesting discussion. Lots of great voice and perfectly matched of the subject. Thank you very much. Um, Alexander Marina uh, Hack uh, said very interesting uh, things about the growing crime of the, the internet. The international community should develop a common standard in the fight against crime. The new technology will not the future space. He said, Parliament, part uh, of the Parliament should be to group the space. Mental elements should be cooperated. Is a new education parliamentary. Unfortunately, the future depends. There is mutual. This. Um, uh, run table and uh, is uh, go to future and uh, I proposition and uh, cooperation of parliamentarians uh, from uh, every country in uh, open world. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you. That was um, a good summary. And as I said, the full document is available for anyone who uh, wishes to uh, comment on that and to add to the draft on the IGF website or simply contact us and we can uh, we can connect you up with that. Um, we're coming to the end of the session. I am always left at the end of these events wishing that we had done three hours rather than 90 minutes because there is never enough time when we come together so rarely to talk about all the issues that we have and I think I've really picked up today that there is a role for parliamentarians to take a strong lead in terms of internet governance. We leave it to governments and we leave it to the internet organizations and to civil society, but the voice of parliamentarians is immensely, immensely important. Um, parliamentarians make the law, parliamentarians hold inquiries, parliamentarians hold government to account. Parliamentarians can ask the difficult questions and can lead. They are the representatives after all. And so I think today has given us a small glimpse into the role and the importance that parliaments and parliamentarians play. And certainly in terms of the Interparliamentary Union and the Centre for Innovation in Parliament, we have been striving since our establishment um, not that long ago at, uh, oh, with the pandemic, it feels like years, but it's not. Um, really only been going, um, two years now, um, we're trying to connect parliaments, we're trying to bring parliamentarians, parliamentary staff together to solve a number of issues around innovation, around technology, and governance of the internet is certainly an issue that's relevant and topical for us. Um, as we can see, certainly from my position trying to moderate this, the technology is never as good as sitting face to face, but oh my, what would we have done without this technology in the pandemic? And I think the last nine months have highlighted how critically important to all of our societies around the world the internet is. So I would like to draw 
this evening to a close by thanking uh, Margarita Escobar, Alexander Kinstein, Mattia Fantinati, Christoph Gokowski, um, Manuel Hoffelin, and Hassan al Hach Inu, uh, Marina Kalaland, and Florence Levy, our contributors, and um, all of you for taking part in this debate. And I'm sorry there hasn't been enough time to introduce more conversation from the floor and more interventions, but I have greatly appreciated the conversation and I have greatly appreciated the contribution from all of you. So please, can I encourage you to review the output draft, to comment on it, and can I encourage the uh, comments made today in terms of uh, networking, connecting parliamentarians in this space to, to think about how we take that conversation forward. And as other panelists have said, I look forward to us all being able to sit down face to face in the same room and join this discussion again next year. But let's not wait a year. Let's, let's try and keep this conversation on governance going, because as we've heard, what parliamentarians think and do matters very, very much in this space. Uh, thank you also to the Under Secretary General of UNDESA and to the Secretary General of the IPU for your welcome and introductions. And thank you to my colleagues at the IPU and uh, UNDESA for the work that's gone into making this a very, very interesting second parliamentary roundtable and most definitely not the last one. So I wish you all an excellent evening and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the Internet Governance Forum. Thank you very much to everybody. Bye bye. Stay safe and well from Bangladesh. Greetings from Bangladesh. Thank you. So long. Bye. Hope to see bye you bye. soon in real life. Bye. Adios, gracias. Bye. Adios. <laughs> gracias, Margarita. Gracias a ustedes, Manuel. We'll see you soon. Gracias. Yes. Chao, chao, a tutti. Stay well. Mm -hmm.